SpaceX has now completed all the critical pre-launch tests for both Ship 38 and Booster 15, clearing the way for Starship's 11th integrated test flight. The final round of launch preparations is underway, and we finally have an official launch target. Let's break down each and every detail. The week opened with a major milestone. Ship 38 completed a full-duration six-engine static fire lasting 10 seconds. This test not only confirmed that all engines are healthy, but also validated propellant flow stability, plumbing, electrical and hydraulic actuation, valves, and other supporting systems. With this, Ship 38 is now officially qualified for launch. The vehicle was removed from the orbital launch mount Tuesday evening and rolled back to the production site. Inside Mega Bay 2, it is undergoing detailed post-test inspections, minor rework, and final outfitting. Engineers are likely performing checks on engines, structural welds, hydraulics, avionics, and cryogenic plumbing seals to make sure everything is flight ready. One visible issue from the static fire was the loss of at least four heat shield tiles. The violent acoustic and structural loads generated during engine ignition are enough to rattle loose, poorly bonded tiles. These missing tiles, along with any remaining gaps, are being replaced during the ongoing prep work. It also appears that some other tiles were loosened by vibrations during the static fire, which are likewise being replaced. Unlike Flight 10, this time SpaceX is not planning to deliberately leave heat shield gaps for stress testing, nor will they repeat the metallic tile experiment. During Flight 10, those experimental metallic tiles failed catastrophically, oxidizing under re-entry heating and depositing a burnt orange coating across the windward side. That test confirmed the material was fundamentally unsuitable for the re-entry environment. The real focus for Flight 11 is on the new crunch wrap insulation system. Each ceramic tile is now wrapped individually in an insulating layer that fills gaps between tiles, forming a sealed interface. This is designed to block plasma and hot gas intrusion into the stainless steel hull during re-entry. Flight 11 will push this system to its limits, subjecting it to extreme thermal gradients, shear forces, and shock heating. Data from this flight will be critical in validating crunch wrap as well as the layered insulation underneath that ultimately protects the ship's structure. Although not officially confirmed, SpaceX could re-attempt dummy Starlink payload deployment on Flight 11, loading Ship 38's payload bay with test units for a suborbital release. During Flight 10, Starship achieved its first ever successful payload deployment, though two units struck the bay's doorframe, highlighting minor clearance issues. A repeat attempt on Flight 11 would test refinements to the release mechanism for flawless operation. If successful, it will pave the way for true operational Starlink V3 deployments, possibly beginning with Flight 13. Booster 15, the super heavy assigned to Flight 11, is already in flight-ready condition. It passed its full-duration static fire and recently received its hot staging ring, completing the last major hardware integration. The remaining tasks include integrating the flight termination system and receiving final certification before stacking. At the current pace, Flight 11 could be ready for launch within two weeks. A local notice to Mariners published last Tuesday indicated SpaceX was targeting October 6th for liftoff. By Friday, the notice had been updated to October 13th. The ship does not appear fully ready yet, with heat shield tile adjustments and other post-static fire repairs still underway. The crunch wrap system may also be causing minor issues in certain regions, requiring adjustments to better secure tiles in those areas. Once the ship is fully prepared and regulatory approvals, along with range clearance are in place, Starship will lift off from Starbase for its 11th integrated flight test by mid-October. Meanwhile, the launch pad is also in final turnaround. The ship's static fire test stand inside the orbital launch mount was removed early Friday morning. Next, the booster hold-down clamps will be reinstalled, and the original propellant feed lines will be restored to connect with the booster's quick disconnect system. Flight 11 will be the last launch from Pad 1, which has hosted all 10 test flights so far, along with dozens of static fires. After Flight 11, Pad 1 will be demolished and rebuilt with a flame trench system modeled after Pad 2, making it compatible with the larger and redesigned vehicles of the next generation. This launch will also serve as the closing chapter for the Block 2 era, clearing the way for SpaceX's transition to Block 3 hardware. Work on the first Block 3 ship, Ship 39, is already underway. The nose cone and payload bay have been stacked inside the Star Factory, where work on the heat shield is ongoing. 
Soon, this assembly will be moved into Mega Bay 2 to join the remaining tank sections. On the booster side, the first Block 3 Super Heavy already has its major tank sections built, with the methane and liquid oxygen tanks currently standing separately inside Mega Bay 1. The aft section was recently joined with the liquid oxygen tank, and the next big step will be stacking both tanks together to form the full core of the booster before moving on to plumbing, avionics, and engine installation. Block 3 incorporates significant design revisions, eliminating outdated parts, adding new structural features, and streamlining interfaces. These upgrades aim to reduce mass, improve manufacturability, and increase reusability. For a deeper breakdown of Block 3 changes, see my earlier videos linked in the description. Testing of Block 3 booster test articles is proceeding one after the other at the Massey site. After months of testing, the Booster 18.1 article, which represented the aft section of the next generation booster, SpaceX has now shifted to testing the forward section of the Block 3 boosters. The new test article, designated Booster 18.3, consists of a five-ring section on top, capped by the new integrated hot stage ring. Unlike the current design, which uses a detachable ring, this integrated version is lighter thanks to reduced material use, and it features wider exhaust passages between its vertical members, allowing the ship's engine plume to escape more freely during hot staging. Making this lightweight ring a permanent part of the booster eliminates the need to discard it after each flight, achieving true full booster reusability. The forward dome has been reinforced with additional welds to withstand the intense thermal and mechanical loads created when Starship's engines fire during stage separation. Just below the hot stage ring are the mounting points for the booster's grid fins. In a key design change, Block 3 boosters will use three grid fins positioned lower on the airframe rather than four mounted higher up. This adjustment shields the fins from the full blast of Starship's exhaust during stage separation, which currently causes minor deformation of the fin webs. The new fins will also feature integrated catch points, eliminating the need for separate hardpoints on the booster body. This means fewer welds, no extra cutouts, and reduced stroll complexity, improving durability and simplifying alignment with the tower's catch arms. The lower portion of Booster 18.3 consists of another five-ring section housing the common dome that separates the methane and oxygen tanks. The test tank was moved to Massey on September 20th, and upon arrival, teams began preparing it for structural testing. The first round of tests took place Thursday evening, with the tank chilled and pressurized with liquid nitrogen to flight-like conditions, while hydraulic pistons applied stress from below to simulate flight loads. This initial campaign lasted just over two hours, and longer duration tests are expected in the coming days. Together, the data from Booster 18.1 and 18.3 will enable SpaceX to validate the entire Block 3 booster design, make refinements, and ultimately pave the way for its debut on Flight 12. Meanwhile, recovery and reconstruction efforts at the Massey test site are progressing at full speed. Reconstruction of the methane tank farm is steadily advancing, with new storage tanks, upgraded pumps, heat exchangers, a blast wall, and other support systems actively being installed. These upgrades will not only restore the farm's functionality, but also improve its resilience and efficiency for handling supercooled propellants. Teams have begun installing propellant delivery lines in the trench, connecting the tank farm to the static fire test area. Once fully installed and covered, the trench will protect critical infrastructure from potential hazards, such as debris or accidental releases during testing. Crews have also designed a new control and electrical bunker for the test site to house monitoring equipment, power systems, and controls. Work on the flame deflector is ongoing, addressing damaged areas and restoring key components of the system. The static fire stand is undergoing a partial rebuild with damaged sections stripped down and soon to be replaced with new steel structures. The ship quick disconnect gantry structure which was completely destroyed during the Ship 36 incident, is being replaced with an upgraded version featuring design improvements to support the next-generation Block 3 Starship testing once the rebuild is complete. The Block 3 booster cryogenic test stand is also taking shape nearby, with teams currently focused on installing the dual booster quick disconnect mechanism, mirroring the one already in place at Pad 2. If progress continues at this pace, Massey will soon re-emerge as a stronger, more capable facility, ready to handle the demands of the next generation of Starship and Super Heavy vehicles ahead of Flight 12. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. 
NASA has launched three spacecraft on a single mission to study space weather, marking a major step forward in understanding the sun's dynamic influence on our planet and the broader solar system. Lifted aboard SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket on September 24th, the mission carried NASA's Interstellar Mapping and Acceleration Probe, the Caruthers Geo Corona Observatory, and NOAA's Space Weather Follow-On, Lagrange 1 satellite. After a smooth ascent and second stage engine cutoff, the three spacecraft were deployed sequentially into a transfer trajectory toward the Sun-Earth L1 Lagrange point, about 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. At this location, the Sun's and Earth's gravitational forces balance, providing a stable platform for continuous solar monitoring. The centerpiece of the mission, IMAP, is designed to map the heliosphere in unprecedented detail. The heliosphere is a vast bubble-like region extending roughly 120 to 350 astronomical units from the sun. It is formed by the constant outflow of the solar wind pushing against the surrounding interstellar medium. The outward pressure of the solar wind balances the inward pressure of interstellar material, creating a protective bubble around the solar system. This shield filters high-energy galactic cosmic rays and interstellar radiation that could strip planetary atmospheres or damage life. IMAP carries a suite of 10 scientific instruments, including particle detectors, spectrometers, and sensors, to produce detailed, time-resolved maps of the heliosphere and its boundaries. By studying how energetic particles are accelerated and transported through this region, IMAP helps scientists understand how cosmic rays propagate inward toward the inner solar system, eventually affecting Earth and space missions. It also provides real-time, in-situ measurements of the sun, essential for space weather forecasting, to protect astronauts, satellites, and spacecraft from energetic particles carried by the solar wind. Complementing IMAP, NOAA's Space Weather Follow-On, Lagrange 1, represents the agency's first dedicated satellite for space weather monitoring. Its primary mission is to provide continuous real-time monitoring of solar wind particles flowing outward from the sun. These measurements are critical for predicting how incoming solar storms will interact with Earth's magnetic field, potentially triggering geomagnetic disturbances that can affect satellites, power grids, and communication systems. Rounding out the mission, NASA's Caruthers Geocorona Observatory delivers the first continuous global imaging of Earth's geocorona, the outermost layer of the atmosphere, dominated by hydrogen atoms, extending up to almost twice the distance to the moon. The observatory detects the faint ultraviolet glow from hydrogen atoms in the geocorona, caused by scattering of solar UV light. This enables scientists to study how solar radiation affects Earth's outer atmosphere and how hydrogen atoms escape into space, gradually altering its composition and density over time. These processes influence Earth's climate stability and habitability, providing a reference for understanding atmospheric evolution on exoplanets. Together, these three satellites represent one of the most comprehensive efforts to understand space weather, ensuring better preparedness for solar storms, while expanding our understanding of the sun's impact across the solar system. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.